Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of the L3 Leadership Podcast, where we are obsessed with helping you grow to your maximum potential and to maximize the impact of your leadership. My name is Doug Smith, and I am your host, and in today's episode, you're going to get to hear my interview with John Donovan, the former CEO of AT&T Communications. When John was the CEO, he was responsible for leading 250,000 people. That's right, I said that correctly, 250,000 people. And so to be able to sit down with him and learn from him about leadership was an absolute joy and an honor. And in the interview, you're going to hear us talk about all kinds of things. We certainly talk about leadership. We talk about how he grows and develops as a leader. We talk about his morning routine. He shares his advice for aspiring managers and people who want to grow their careers. You are going to absolutely love this, so make sure you get a pen and paper out as you watch this interview. You are in for such a treat. Enjoy this interview with John Donovan. Well, hey, John, thank you so much for being willing to do this interview, and why don't we just start off with you just telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Uh, I'm John Donovan, and uh, I just recently retired from my position as the CEO of AT&T Communications. Wow. And you, from what I understand, you were responsible for 200,000 people. Is that true? Well, uh, you know, that's the ballpark. 250,000 is the closer number, but yeah, that's uh, it's in the range. Yeah. Wow. So I'm just curious, can you give us a little backstory of, of you? I'm just curious, what do you wish you knew, people knew about your journey uh, to get to that place where you're leading 250,000 people? Well, I just, I was just reading an article, which uh, I didn't realize, labeled me really as a unicorn, someone moving from one socioeconomic class to another. So I get asked that question a lot. And I think that, um, you know, certainly genetics help being born to great parents. Uh, I think a, a big part of my success that shaped me was being uh, from Pittsburgh. Now, there's a million mm-hmm. places that one can be from, but, you know, there's an egalitarian um, way about Pittsburgh where your the color of your collar matters a lot less than the kind of person you are. And so um, I think all of those things, you know, my parents, my coming from a large family, being from the north side of Pittsburgh, they always play an important role. And uh, But the, the thing that it's as simple as it sounds is that the great tiebreaker in life's hard work. Hmm. And um, And there's really no substitute for you putting the time in, not just in the work and the production, but putting the time into yourself. I think that you you can evolve yourself into most anything that you want to be. You can become whatever it is you you think you want to become, but it's not through magic and relationships and networking and all those things that people think are shortcuts. Hmm. Um, It's actually the long cut, which is hunkering down, doing the work on both yourself and um, and the work that you do at the office. Yeah. So I'm curious then, I always like to ask leaders what the, the prices that they paid are to get to where they are. And I'm curious, what did you do and what prices did you pay that, that set you apart? Or as Jack Welch has get out of the pile, right? If there's 250,000 employees, I'm sure you're not the only one that had aspirations to become a leader in the organization. What set you apart from everyone else? Um, you know, I, I don't think that you necessarily have to climb out of the pile or leap out of the pile or even recognize you're in a pile. Sometimes mm. you, there's going to be someone that gets pushed out of the pile. Um, <laughs> and so I, I don't, I don't, you know, rest a lot in the, you know, what did I do to cause it? You just have to take things a day at a time, take the thing that's in front of you. And you look at that and say, how do you become great at your job? Mm. You don't become great at your job thinking about the next job. You become great at your job thinking, I love my job. Like, I love what I'm doing. I can't believe that they would empower me to, to do this. And so I've, every job I've ever had felt to me like the most important job in the world. Wow. And I think when you bring that spirit to your job every day, then when it's time for the next job, then, you know, you, uh, you're, you're automatically ready. And so the, the little things that I would do is I always did my, my boss's job in – my head. So if we were sitting at a table and we were kind of talking about something and, you know, the boss had a decision to make, I would, I would prosecute the room the same way he was. And I'd be thinking, okay, what would I do in his shoes? Oh, he went to the carrot. I probably would have gone to the stick. It'll be interesting to see if that works or doesn't. And so I think so often people are so driven by fear that you 
uh, because they, they, they're worried about, well, I'm being judged. I want the next job. They're always looking at me. I'm going to have to do a really good job. And I always felt like I was on a completely different mindset. It's like, I love my job. If I'm not the best one to do it, I shouldn't be doing it. In the meantime, I'm going to figure out just in my head, what would it be like to be my boss? And then I just always felt prepared for the next job. And, um, and so I tended to jump into jobs, learn them quickly. And everybody would say, how do you learn so fast? Well, I already did the job for the last couple of years because I've been doing it in my head. So, um, you know, those are little life hacks, I guess, when you look at them that way. But I don't feel like it was um, particularly profound. So, you know, I'm not going to be writing a how-to book on a cookbook on, on how to get in head, ahead in life because um, I think if you're prepared every day to take the thing that's in front of you, that's the best preparation that you can have. It's mental prepar- preparation, not intellectual preparation. It's not the result of a bunch of steps that you, you set up in a cookbook. It really is letting the world give you what it's going to give you and just being ready for it. Yeah. I, I never actually thought through of actually doing your boss's job in your head. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, I know young leaders often want mentor. And yeah. actually, in, in my research, you're actually not a fan of mentoring. You're a fan of having advocates yeah. from what you've told. Can you talk about that? And I'm curious, did the bosses that you had, did you view them as, as advocates in your life? Is that the greatest source of your growth? And can you just talk about that relationship? Well, but if you think about building a network, um, and creating a mentor, at some point, what happens when you're ready to run past your mentor? Hmm. There, there's this, in, in the mentor's head, there, there are not that many people that are enlightened enough to say, this person is going to blow away past me. Let me get him a new mentor. So in some respects, the mentors anchor you um, into an environment. And I always felt like um, the world is a mentor. So, you know, the, I learned lessons from people that I were doing things wrong or incorrectly or things that I would, boy, I don't want to be like that. So your eyes and your ears uh, are your observation points and every, the whole world's your mentor. Every person is a mentor. You can be taught things by, you know, the security guard on the, the drive through into the uh, parking lot, the receptionist, you know, all of those people in their own way can touch you and teach you. And if you were to put yourself in a narrower view to say, I'm, you know, I'm going to have a mentor and let me ask you five questions and get advice. I'm not a big fan of that. I'm a fan Mm -hmm. of saying, if you can find a couple of people that will advocate for you, where they say, you know what, I'm going to take on your case. And if I'm going to advocate for you, we got to have a serious conversation, you know, Doug, you're not preparing enough. You know, you went into that last job. Why did you not get the job? And I think you went into it with an arrogant mindset. You didn't talk to enough people. You didn't have a plan. Um, and and when, when you move from just someone who sits in a room and, the, and they're all talking about who's going to get promoted, the difference is a mentor will keep quiet if the room's moving against the candidate. An advocate will say, wait a minute, I just want to stop. I think we're down a path that we really shouldn't be. I think we're focused on the wrong stuff. I will stake my reputation that she is ready to go do this job. That's an advocate. And that can overcome a lot of uh, negativity. And and so uh, I've often said, if you find an advocate, you should cling to their leg and never let go. Like never let them go because uh, you're only going to get a few of those in your life. So everybody searches for a network and mentors. Um, and mentoring is sometimes drive by advice hmm. wow. and there's no consequence to bad advice. Hmm. Um, so, so how do you build that relationship? Well, when you say, look, I'm going to need your help and I would really like for you to be my advocate, then it gets to be a whole different conversation. And that's why I've always kind of parsed those words in a way that said a network and a mentor are not, not only, uh, not necessary, they sometimes can be weigh you down. Yeah. And I heard you share a story that I want you to talk about because I think at, when I talk to emerging leaders, we want, we want an advocate, right? I think everyone listening to this would say, I want that. Um, but sometimes you need to have advocates that you may not even connect with. And you shared a story one time about an advocate in your life who 
I, I forget what he had you read, but you actually didn't connect with this guy or didn't like him, at least at first. Right. And he really challenged you and helped you grow. Can you talk about just being teachable, even if it's with someone who you may not connect with naturally? Yeah. So, you know, it was early in my career and I had a, a boss who, you know, um, was a little bit of a, a bully, had a way to do things. And, uh, but what he did is he wanted to take me out to lunch and he wanted to challenge me all the time to, so he'd send me, I was working ungodly hours at the time. And, um, and he was sending me business week and fortune magazine and the Washington post and New York times. And then he would grill me on what's going on in the insurance industry, which had nothing to do with what we were doing. And it, it actually, at the time, I had this sense of diligence where, you know, you're, you're not going to get the best of me. I am going to find time to do this. And now if you look back and you'd say, well, you know, what are my greatest strengths? My greatest strength in business is connecting dots in things that are unrelated, which mm -hmm. is really a function of what uh, this guy taught me. And so you don't have to fall in love with uh, instructors um, in order for them to make a big impact on you. That's so good. Yeah. Um, and I'll just leave this open-ended. What advice do you have for emerging leaders, maybe starting out their career, maybe in early management? Uh, again, maybe not to get out of the pile, but, but just to set themselves apart and to grow and develop as a leader. Well, I think that the, that the easy thing to do is to be accomplish the things that I've accomplished and then go back and look at it because that you, you remove yourself from the high-temperature oven that you lived in. So sometimes you can for, forget uh, the impact that the temperature had. And so when you are progressing in a career and you want to stand out, what are the things that allows you to stand out? You want to stand out because of your maturity. So you look, mm -hmm. you'd say, what, what would a 20 year veteran say is the most important thing of success? And I always found that, that to me, when, when you, when you make a lot of money, then you have a different mindset because you're not worried about money. But that's just numbers on a piece of paper. You can have that exact same mindset when you're younger. Hmm. The same way um, you want to, you're driven by your parents' approval. You can get that when you're young. That's just, that's ephemeral stuff. That's straightforward hmm. to go get. Sit down with your parents and say, how am I doing compared to how you thought? You, most people, their parents would say, you know, I had aspirations for you when I was holding you as a baby, but you've exceeded those. Um, and so in most cases, you can get some of these burdens, emotional burdens off early. And so then what you just, the greatest thing is to be yourself. Hmm. And because if you're yourself and you're not a phony self, it's easy to keep track of. You just go and do your thing every day. You just be you. It's when you try to go in and fit in a culture. And then a year later, you're somebody that you're not designed to be. You're trying to be the workaholic when you've got two young kids. You're trying to be the brilliant person when you don't have time to read and keep up. And so that becomes weight. It becomes weight that you, you, you carry. And I always found that the people who had emotional maturity were the ones that could say, I don't know. Um, why don't you explain that to me? Back up a little bit. Um, because there's a, there's a humanity to that where the people could say, wow, that, that woman's brilliant. But she's not afraid to tell you she doesn't know something. Hmm. So that pretend thing that I have to know everything, I'm working harder than you, I'm the complete package, is a, is a destructive mechanism. Because it's a false you, and then you go home, and now you got this, you're dropping this weight in the house. And that doesn't really do anything for the, for the household. So um, the simplest thing is just do you, be you, and do that as early in your life as you can. I love that. And, and actually, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your core values. Uh, in, in an interview that I read about you, you said, life is much easier when you're true to your genuine self. And when you're in a very large scale job like a CEO, you have to know your principles and values. And when you do, decisions need to come instinctively from the core of who you are. I'm just curious, what are the, the values and principles that you let out of as the CEO? And, and how did those even develop? Well, um, over the course of time, you always will have your values. And it's just not a good process for you to write them down because so often you environmentally adopt the values of others. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example. Um, courage. Courage is a really important value to me. How does courage manifest? Well, when I was in my 20s, I remember the exercise of putting my to-do list together every day. And then I would sort of rank them 
easiest to hardest. And then I went after the hardest ones first thing in the morning. I was energetic, um, but I thought if I can make my day like a downhill ski, let me climb the mountain the first thing in the morning. And that created kind of a, a backdrop of courage. But I told myself, because I'm competitive, uh, with my self-awareness was like, be bold, like get the tough stuff done early. And then, then it was like, hey, that's working for me. So now I'm going to be the person who's not afraid to have frank conversations, not blunt and edgy, um, but, but not afraid to have a conversation when something isn't working out, whether that's an employee that's a bad fit for the business, whether that's um, someone who was doing a great job until six months ago and suddenly they're just not performing. Um, and then also, then you start to build this paradigm of truth. And now you find the courage and truth go together. And so the, the exercise isn't to take my list and adopt it. The exercise is look in the mirror and figure where you are on your list of, of values. And then um, if, you're, if you're not proud of that list, if you're honest with yourself, the list is going to have stuff that you're not proud of. Hmm. And that's the stuff, if you can work the things off the list that ought to be there, um, I think you're going to end up with a pretty good list because a lot of us, that list is going to come from your parents and your early childhood and where you grew up and all that stuff. And so I often uh, disappoint people because I take the magic out of, you know, career development and put it back to kind of genes and neighborhood and kindergarten activities. But that's the essence, wow. really. Uh, and if you can just be that truest self, the truest self is going to rise to the highest place. Hmm. So the, you just have to get the teenager out of you and go back to the, the more the essence you and then you're going to get to the highest place you can. And for most of us, that's much higher than we would aspire to, to, to do if we were to write it on a piece of paper. Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about personal growth. You mentioned making a to-do list in the beginning of the day and knocking out the hardest thing first. Can you talk to us a little bit about your morning routine? I, I heard you talk about it in a setting, and I thought it was interesting. Well, um, you know, I always tried to own the morning. So um, I think device addiction is a real thing. I think people wake up and they're, uh, body temperature and blood pressure and pulse start to get in a tempo that's driven by your device and what happened while you slept. And so I always felt like, again, I, I'm a competitive person by nature. So I think in terms of winning and losing, um, my thought on that is I'm going to own my morning and I'm not going to let someone take ownership of that part of my day and that part of my life. And so you know, I got up, I meditated, I, you know, I exercised, read, uh, you know, I, I did my, my morning routine. And so from like 4 or 4.30 in the morning until 7.30, I, w I owned it. I owned it. No one could intervene in it. Um, it. It belonged to me. And so that just sets you for, to be so much more productive for the day. That doesn't mean you wouldn't uh, do something in the morning that's work related, but you owned it. It was yeah. an act, a conscious act, and not a reaction. And I think a lot of people have are are living life on their heels, not realizing that they don't have uh, control over the situation because they're just react constantly in react mode. Yeah, so it's all about living intentionally. And I know I read that when you were 25 years old, you created a life plan for the next 30 years of your life. Mm -hmm. And I believe you recently uh, changed that. Can you just talk about creating a life plan and what you learned from that exercise? Yeah, uh, you know, when I was in my mid-20s, I, I set goals. And at the time, it wasn't a life plan. Um, it was more of goals. And more of the goals were related to uh, financial accomplishment, career development. But it 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 set me up to be done at 55. So um, when I was approaching 55 years old, a few years back, I, um, I decided to, to refresh the plan, but I would do it for rest of life. And so, um, and I think those things help. And I think that the principles of putting a plan, putting things on a piece of paper, allow you to make important trade-offs. Um, if you put what your financial goal is, then you're going to ask yourself, is that really an important thing? Hmm. Or are relationships more important? Um, and it just allows you to feel more in control of things. So what I talk about all the time in, in career planning is 
you should use horizons that ensure that you can survive a bad bo bad boss and not have it affect your goals. Huh. Otherwise, it's not really a goal; it's a tactic, right? So now all of a sudden, I'm in survival mode because I don't like my boss and my job is, you know, this company merged with that company and I'm under pressure. Like from a personal development standpoint, that's an in a 35, 40 year career, that's nothing. Wow. And so a bad boss for two years is nothing. And so you have to use timelines and have objectives that can survive short-term shocks to the system. And I think that that's inadvertently what I had done because I put things essentially into decades, 25 to 35, uh, 35 to 45, 45 to 55. And I put broad themes like, you know, in the beginning, I'm going to take, I'm going to say yes to every career opportunity that allows for growth. And so a lot of my friends here in Pittsburgh had careers where they never really moved. And like for me, it was like wherever I need to be, I'll be. So I ha have lived in um, Wisconsin and Minnesota and Washington, D.C. and uh, the Bay Area and San Antonio and San Diego. And so I've become an outdoor cat. Um, and so I have a lot of these experiences because I, they were f foundational in my plan between 25 and 35 to grow. Yeah. And then 35 to 45 was about mastery of a profession. That, that's the point in time where you start to narrow your world down and say, I want to be an expert at something. I want to be, and I got to be one of the best, not, not just the best effort I can put forward, but I want to be like one of the best in the world. What's it take to, to do that? And then between 45 and 55, you just, you yield the fruits of that. Wow. Now that isn't exactly how my career worked, but it's close enough. The important thing is take your risks when you're young. Once you get a family and you get in the motion, then uh, it's, it gets much harder to be flexible. And if you wake up at 40 with you know three kids, a house, and a spouse, um, it's kind of hard to say, hey, let's just start moving around. Yeah. So your flexibility narrows, and I think that building a plan that, that worked that way for me was very beneficial because it got me in a a mindset of taking risks when I was younger and then I really focused on being good at what I do um, in the, the mid years and then you yield the fruits of that you, you know your last decade yeah now I don't know much about your family and so I don't know if this is relevant or not but I'm just curious with all the moving you had to do with the price that you had to pay the hard work uh, did that impact your family and would you do anything differently when you encourage young leaders who have young families such as myself no no, no I wouldn't change anything um, I, I think that um, it's unhealthy to live much in the past. I think that the important thing is it's so important to pick the right spouse hmm. um, and, or, or any significant other or even your friend group because work-life balance, and people always want to you know, think about how do I balance life. It's, it's not – everybody wants to measure it in hours. I'm working too much. I need more – uh, vacation time. It's not time, it's guilt. What you want to avoid is being around people who make you feel guilty mm -hmm. for doing what you need to do. And I've been very uh, blessed with my, uh, my wife being willing to support me in anything I needed to do. So that might be, you know, when you're 42 years old, the world is shifting technologically and you say, look, I need six months of like a lot of my weekends and nights to go through white papers and study stuff. And I'm going to be an expert in, in this pivot that the world is taking. And my wife was always like, go for it. Oh, that's awesome. and, and so my wins became our wins, became family wins. And I went back to my daughter. I don't know. She was probably 22 or 23 at the time. And I told her I wanted to apologize to her. Uh, for maybe not spending as much time with her as I should have. And uh, it was interesting because she really uh, not only gave me a get out of jail card, she really inspired me because she said, you know, you, you've always done things the right way. And, mm -hmm. and so sometimes spending hours with your kids is the most important thing, but sometimes inspiring them is, is as good or better. And, uh, and so I, I always think when you look at these, these, elements of balance and family and all that stuff, surround yourself with people that are supportive and most everything will, will work its way through. Be honest about stuff. Like if my wife calls me and says, you need to stay home, I'll stay home. Um, 
because she'll so seldom ask that. And uh, and then I think when when you think about the sacrifices that are necessary, if you look forward and say, you know, I'm going to build have to overcome these mountains of sacrifices, then it will be mountains of sacrifices. I honestly don't look at any of that as ever having been a compromise or a sacrifice. I just loved what I did every day. Yeah. And, um, and if, if it didn't sound good in the beginning, I gave it a shot. And then I fell in love with it. And then, you know, things, it, when you have that mindset, it's, just, it's a day's work. And if you're enjoying it, it's good. And then nothing looks big and onerous in front of you. You said that you don't enjoy living in the past or over guilt. And I read somewhere that you actually one day made an entire list of every mistake that you had ever made. And then I believe you threw it away and yeah. you were done with it. Can yeah. you talk about that exercise? I thought that was so fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, you know, I, I, I caught myself drifting, thinking I wish I'd done this over, I wish I'd done that over. And uh, I thought, you know, what, what makes that go away? Is it, what, what is it, first of all? You feel guilty or... You know, and, and we all have it. So I just sat down one day and uh, and I wrote it all out. And it was like 12 pages. And it went back to being 10 years old. Wow. And then it's, a, it's cathartic to just write it all down and then just threw it away and thought, it's one of the best documents I ever wrote and it had the <laughs> shortest shelf life. Um, but it just found that it really allowed me to let it go. Hmm. Last thing I wanted to ask you about personal growth was uh, I thought this was interesting. You pick a virtue a month to work on. Mm-hmm. Where I, I think Benjamin Franklin did that. Is where did you get that, and, and what do you do intentionally with that? I'm just curious. Um, you know, for me, I always look. I'm Catholic, so I look at the wisdom of the saints. Um, I've always been fascinated by uh, acquisition of virtue and how you think about the sequencing of them. And uh, so I ran across a publication probably seven or eight years ago that just had a virtue of the month. And so I adopted it and uh, I put it on a calendar and I just read a small clip every day on the virtue. And then you found by the middle of the month, you were sick of the virtue. Hmm. And then by the end of the month, you were ready to get on to the next one. And then by the second year, then you started to think, you know, the problem isn't with the virtue I'm working on or being tired of reading about it. I'm tired of failing at it. <laughs> so then you start to naturally adapt, wow. you know, how you, how you address these virtues. And, uh, and then after a while, it became like a really good exercise. You look forward to trying to be generous for a month. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's not easy to wake up every day but it's good, it's good work because if you wake up every day and you say, okay, well, I'm going to be the complete package, that's too much stress, too hard, too many things. You know, like, but, but it's really simple. You say, I'm going to find ways to be generous today mm-hmm. and, um, or I'm going to just slow down and every person who talks to me, I'm going to give them my undivided attention. And you do that for like a month and then you do that in year two and year three and year four then all of a sudden you're developing better habits. And that's really, we're just creatures of habit and you want to discard your bad habits and keep growing your good habits. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about money as well. So you're a unicorn, right? I've skipped multiple classes. What have you learned about money and what do you tell people? Because I feel like 90% of our country is just chasing money. What do people need to hear? Well, um, I don't think with more money comes more happiness. Um, Certainly not something I've uh, experienced or observed. Um, But I do think there's a mindset change. Uh, When you get to a point where you have a goal financially and you make it, it's not like the other goals because those goals are usually built around um, family uh, security values and things that are intrinsic and really good. So, you could say it's the root, chasing it's the root of all evil. Um, having it might be the, the seed of, of all good hmm. because you can s- stop the worrying. So what I would tell people is okay. you can have the same mindset shift younger because they're just numbers on a piece of paper. They, they really are. If you're living the way you want to live, you have you know, the, the necessities for your family um, and you have your kids in a school that you're happy with and you're 
kind of eating and entertaining and being around friends and all that stuff, um, having a bigger party or a fancier menu or a tablecloth versus not a tablecloth, those mean those are meaningless. Wow. But so I do think though, a financial goal produces a series of things that ask you, why would I need the money? And if you ask yourself, why do I need the money? Then you're at the essence of what's good. I want to be able to take my spouse out. I want to, you know, go out with my friends a couple times a month. You know, I want to be able to donate for the, for this or that cause. Um, that stuff you can you can achieve most of that stuff at a much lower financial goal than some people set out because this idea of you want to be rich, you can think you're rich, you can think like you're rich, uh, you can get your values right, and that will be more important than what you have on a bank statement. John, one thing I love to ask leaders about is how they deal with the, the pressure and, and responsibility that comes with leadership. You were at AT&T when the iPhone came out. Obviously, you have stockholders. So many people that look to you for leadership every day. How do you deal with sleepless nights? How do you deal with the weight of that responsibility? Do you have any tips for us as leaders? Yeah, I think that um, you know one of the principles you should live by is that um, you should never look to succeed alone nor fail alone. Mm -hmm. if, if you're in a boat with a team, the first thing is that you're never, it's never a completely lonely exercise. The only thing that is lonely is occasionally on the really big decisions, you have to go inside yourself because the evidence, you know, might be split. And there, there are those times where you have to make a hard call. But I, I think that when you, the, the two sides of that sword are when you take all of the successes and everything that's going well and everything that's right in your position and you put that on yourself and your ego, like I made this, I did this. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden it crumbling down is everything to you because wow. everything is built around you and a, a, a worldview that, that is through your eyes. Then it's all about you on the way down. So if it's not about you on the way up, it won't be about you on the way down. And then you'll have much less pressure because you'll just say, look, I'm going to do the best I can. And I'm the best person to make this decision. I'm the one that has to make this decision. And I'm not going to be right all the time. But I also am not going to draw all of the um, my emotional um, self-worth out of things that go right and things that go wrong. And because it's, it really is part of a team and a system. And um, so I didn't really find that I had a lot of sleepless nights. That's so good. I ask a lot of leaders that. That's probably the best response I've ever heard. That's well, incredible. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I want to ask about creating culture. How do you create and sustain a culture within an organization that has 250,000 plus employees in it? And, uh, and just make sure that everywhere you go, it's, you see the culture. Yeah, so if you look, you go back and to the earlier answer about, um, you know, what's the secret to success? Be yourself. Culture is a sum of individuals. So the, the real cultural juice, once you get everybody just being themselves, is to recruit great people. Hmm. Make sure that every person you, go, you bring in um, is greater than the one that retired or left. And so you're, gonna, you're not going to have the control you think you are. You're going to be yourself and you're going to be a leader and you're going to project certain values of, I mentioned some of them, of, of courage and being genuine and all that sort of stuff. And then what you're really doing is you're just empowering people to do the same thing. Hmm. And, uh, and so the more closed you become, the more closed they are. So as leaders in the business, the business, the, the, uh, the large groups of people, they're going to react to you. And so it's easy to say and hard to do. It's, you tell everybody, come be your best self, and that's good enough. It's our job to make sure that it all gets together into workflows and and customer care and all that stuff, but come just be you, go do you, but then you have to do the same thing. And if you're, if there's a gap between what you're asking your people to do and what you're doing, mm. they'll, they'll follow you. And so the simplest thing is, you know, culturally, um, people want to describe culture as we're customer centric. And then you say to the leader, 
how much time are you spending with customers? Mm. Well, you know, I got, I got, I got to deal with Wall Street. I got to go to Washington. I got legislative stuff. The answer is you're not, and so therefore people are looking at you and saying, "We're not a customer-centered organization. We're financially oriented." And so you have to start with your own calendar, your own words, your own town halls, and and if if that's not Aligned to what you're trying to describe, people will pick that up, and they don't. They don't gravitate to imitating the words you wrote. They'll imitate what you're doing, hmm. and uh, and that's how you get these cultural gaps, or sometimes you get toxic cultures, because it's the leader is the bad apple in the bunch. Wow. Uh, last question before we dive into the lightning round. I'll just leave this open ended, and it could be a similar answer. But what advice do you have to managers for being great managers? To their team, um, I think you have to wake up every morning and and have a service mentality. Like if you look and ask fifty people that work closely with me, you know, what's what's John's management style? You'll get a different answer. Um, because what I try to be is what what that group or that person needs me to be. So I always used to say that you know Michael Jordan was winning scoring titles, then he was Defensive Player of the Year, and then he started winning championships. And to win championships, he might have to do any of the above on any given night. Wow. But it's just what it took to win that night. And you're not going to win by being a scorer every night. That's evidenced in most sports that the people who lead the league in scoring are selling the ones winning championships. Um, and so that's true of a manager as well. You have to get up in the morning. You have to look and know whether the organization needs a kick in the butt or a hug. And um, if you go and kick them in the butt every day, then you're going to get a certain set of behaviors. If you go hug them every day, you're going to go get a certain set of behaviors. And the truth is that organizations are sums of people. So they, it still is those acts of um, compassion and kindness or hug or kind word. And then other times it's, you know, motivation and, you know, kind of uh, putting a, lighting a fire under them. And I think the manager's job is to not think that they get to be who they want to be because you won't be as successful as, if you wake up in the morning and say, what do I think I need to do to get this organization to the next level? Mm -hmm. And it might be rebounding, it might be scoring, or it might be playing good defense. And, and it might actually, even within an organization, be all three things in one day. Love it. Well, let's try, dive right into the lightning round again. These are just a bunch of fun questions that I ask every leader. Um, first one is, what is the best advice you've ever received and who gave it to you? Uh, best advice I ever received was watching someone call home, tell a lie to his spouse, and uh, and then go on about his business. And I told myself at that point that I would never confuse um, truth uh, as it relates to your spouse in the workplace because it just was like so unnecessary. And I looked at it and it was, oh, my God, he just was trying to not have the pressure. Hmm. He wanted to stay late at work. and uh, And I thought... Wow. And that, that was a great lesson. Like I can remember where I was standing, that he was picking the phone. It was so profound for me because it was so wholly unnecessary. Wow. Um, but it, it shaped me in how I view truth and how you relate your work with your family. So good. If you could put a quote on a billboard for everyone to read, what would it say? Be yourself. What's the best purchase you've made in the last year for $100 or less? Best purchase I made this past year and every year has been a book. There's always a book that will fill a hole in your your mind, body, or soul, and you got to, you know, continue to try to find the words of someone else's life and their knowledge to fill in your gaps. It's always out there. It's always available, and it's always inexpensive. So this is my next question, and I know you read a thousand books, but what is what are the top two books you recommend right now that come to mind? Uh Boy, these are always tough questions because I have so many things. And I, I tend to read in, in three tracks. One is, um, let's say, science and knowledge. One is uh, perhaps history. Um, and then another one is just something that's, I won't say self-help, but, you know, things that are designed that way. Um, and uh, so I, I think the thing that, I'm on an exploration of, there's a book called Factfulness, um, and there are other books like it that are really trying to myth bust about how we think about things, how do we 
generalize? How are we misconceiving math? And to give you a simple example, in factfulness, one of the things is if you ask the average person what percentage of the world lives in poverty right now, is it 50, is it 27, is it 9, most would say 50%, and yeah. the answer is 9%. Wow. So, so in this country, we're thinking that you know, things are bad, but globally, globalization is working. Like the number of people that are living in poverty in some of these third world countries is dropping dramatically. And so um, I, I think those are, are worthwhile endeavors. I do think right now that every person should not contribute to the divisiveness of, that has crept not from just our country and political parties, but is working its way into families, mm. into dinner tables and church pews and all those things. And I think we all have to say, what can we do to learn the other side of the argument? And what can we do behaviorally to make sure we're not making that any worse than, than it needs to be? And normally that is not solved by sh uh, shouting your opinion louder um, so that the person <laughs> can hear it better. Um, so I, I think that there, there's a lot of that kind of stuff out there. Yeah, you, you retired recently. Yeah. And I'm just curious, now that you're retired, what are you passionate about? Uh, you know, there's a period of time that will be unique for everyone of how long does it take before you get your thought process back. Um, you know, stress is a funny thing because no matter how zen you are, it's the analogy I always use is that if you're out in the rain for year after year after year, the rain doesn't bother you. But, but you're still getting wet. So, so you, once you're out in the rain and you come in, now you have to dry off. It's a different amount of time for, for each person. So I don't, I'm not sure I've fully gotten my thought process back to say, what am I passionate about? Hmm. Uh, my, my wife said I'm like a mountain lion trying to be a house cat, and that's not good. <laughs> it's not good for the lion, and it's definitely not good for the house. So <laughs> I'm going to have to figure it out pretty quick here. Okay, okay. Um, what is your – uh, I'll skip that one. Mm, do you have a favorite failure that led to success? Uh, you know, all my failures are um, judgments on people because, mm. you know, all great business results – are going to the result of a great team effort with a bunch of people that went out and accomplished. Most of the failures, like I say, business problems wear, normally wear shoes. And so uh, when you make a bad assessment on a person, um, it can most of the problems you have kind of lend themselves back to, to bad calls on people. You mm. trusted the wrong person with the wrong job. Um, and so... One should be very careful in selecting your friends, your spouse, your work colleagues, and all that kind of stuff. Because at the end of the day, most of your the the problems you're going to have in life are going to center around people and relationships. And um, and so you can have all the best virtues in the world around, you know, being open minded and forgiving and all that stuff. But you know, when you got to deliver a result for a business, and you're finding that you put a weak link in there, mm -hmm. it's your it's your problem. Um, not only that. It, that you put it in there, but you got to go fix it then. And those are always the tough ones. You said earlier that the, let the world be your teacher and you can learn from anyone, which I, I absolutely agree with. And you, through your career, had the opportunity to spend time with some world-class leaders. I'm just curious, when you get in a room with a leader, you get a lunch or a dinner with a high-level leader, are the, is there a question or two that you always ask them just to, to get insight from them? Uh, no. No. Um, I think what, when you meet a great leader there's something on their mind. Hmm. So we always view, I always feel like in most things, human nature can fail us because the first thing everyone worries about is I'm going to meet the Dalai Lama or the Pope. What am I going to say? And the truth is you don't have to say anything because there's something on their mind too. Wow. And they're walking into this thing and you don't really have to do anything other than say hello. And oftentimes they'll say, great, I found a business leader and this is what I want to tell business leaders or I want to try this story out on you or, uh, you know, they start asking you questions and you can react. So seldom do you have to walk in and, and be responsible for an awkward pause. Hmm. One of the things that made them successful is they kind of know what they're going to say. <laughs> so in all of those 
times where I might have been nervous, it was a waste of, of energy because whether it's Oprah or, you know, the CEO of a large corporation, they have an agenda and they have a set of things they want to say. And, and you're robbing yourself of their insight if you're trying to put your agenda onto them. At the level that you led at, aside from your family, what, what was the greatest investment of your time? Um, people. ROI, people. People. You know, um, it, it, it sounds cliche, but I think as you progress in a career and you're trying to win championships, um, it works just like the earlier analogy of going from scoring to rebounding to defense to whatever you need to be. The same thing occurs in business. Hmm. You see a result in the beginning, you're really thrilled because you produced it, and then you realize that's not as much fun at happy hour when you're there by yourself. So that's, let's get this team <laughs> thing going, and then let's yeah. do a team happy hour to celebrate. Yeah. And then you get past the age that you want to go to happy hour, so then <laughs> your celebration is more of an internal celebration where you're sitting and you're saying, you know, I helped Doug get that outcome. Hmm. And then you find at some point, where your greatest satisfaction is that when Doug goes and gets that outcome, no one knows it except you and Doug. Mm-hmm. And Doug comes back and says, thank you, that was really exactly the advice uh, that I needed at exactly the time I needed it, whether it was a, a business decision uh, that, or whether it was just personal, how do you deal with, deal with the situation. And, and that's, you know, that those analogies are all over the place. Coaches that have been around a long time, they love seeing their coaching tree starting mm-hmm. to win championships elsewhere. Um, and ultimately, you don't wake up one day and have a bunch of people who call you and say thanks for everything you did. It's, it's, it's reputationally built over decades where you find 20 minutes to have a coffee with someone mm-hmm. or you although you don't feel like it, you engage somebody on the elevator. You know, like all of those things, the sum total of those things over a life's work produce a, a different person, hmm. both you and the other person, than it would be if you say, okay, well, I'm tired. I'm going to try to sneak in through the back stairwell. And I'm an introvert, so I don't like that. I don't like it. Um, wow. It's not like I, I draw energy from it. Um, but, you know, small habits done with repetition produce the the person that you are. What have you done that other people should do? Maybe an experience you've had. I'll just make it up going to the Super Bowl, a place that you visited. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll break it into a couple of categories. Um, I, I think that if you're a sports lover, uh, going to one of the golf majors is like if you go to a Super Bowl, it's kind of fun because you see lots of famous people going around, or you go to the Grammys and you see all the great singers. But when you go to a, a golf major, the course and the walking around and the quiet is is a, such a better experience than the noise at a football stadium for me. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I think it's underappreciated how fun it is to see these folks you see on television all the time, but realize that it's not some noisy, crazy, you know, uh, kind of thing. So, so I think that's. Uh, Underrated, And when people go to Europe, I think that in the history of Europe, people go to the museums, they don't go to the churches. Hmm. Some of the places, uh, the, the religious history of Europe is really um, an amazing thing. And, uh, and I, the other thing I would say is on every business trip, I asked myself, if I, was, if I was never going to travel again, and this was my last trip in life, what would I do? Huh. I love that. And I found myself, you know, I've, I've been on the, in, in, you know, in mainland China inside somebody's home who we, a guy just knocked on a door and said, hey, do you <laughs> mind if these guys come in and hang out with you for a while? But like th- those things are priceless. Or you wow. go to, you know, India and you get into someone's home. And, you know, those are the things that when I look back, they're, they were like magical because, mm. you know, you go to India and you see what India has to offer. But how many people will you know, as a U.S., Caucasian, European descent would go into their home. Wow. And, and so those, those things, you know, produced a lot of really magical experiences over the years. And it's usually 
just finding a few extra hours and a little extra energy to run here, drive there, hop on the subway here, and then you can see some really amazing stuff. Is there anything left on your bucket list? Uh, I don't really live so much for a bucket list. I'm you know, more trying to work now on trying to get the kids to be hmm. successful in their chosen fields um, and make sure my wife wants to see, gets to see everything that she wants to see. So much more of my rest of life plan centers around things that are for the rest of my family. It's sort of the, the first half, the things were optimized around my career and success, and the back half will be um, centered around the rest of the family's needs and success. And, um, it seemed like a fair trade. Yeah. <laughs> and if you could have coffee with 20-year-old John Donovan, what would you tell him? Relax. Hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, we're all... When we're young, we always have this view that somehow this fear of missing out, uh, that, that every transaction counts, and they really don't. Mm -hmm. It's really, you know, your, your life's work is the sum of a million small things. Um, and so when you're younger, you're playing for the big event, the next promotion, the whatever. And that's not, that's not your life's work. Your life's wow. work is in the brush strokes. Um, so we always think that it's color by numbers when it's really an impressionist painting. Hmm. When you're, you wow. get to be old, you want to step back and you can look at that and say, that's a beautiful piece of art. But when you walk up close, it's, it's not precise. Hmm. And, uh, and so when you're in your 20s, just relax because do the right things every day. You get passed over for promotion, who cares? You get, wow. you know, the business is not doing well. Don't worry about it. Like just deal with what's in front of you, love your job do it the best you can. And then when you stand back in your life's work, you will, you will have painted, you know, a masterpiece, but don't expect staring at it close. It's going to have, you know, clear lines. So when you're at the end of your life, looking at that masterpiece, what do you want to be remembered for? And what do you want your legacy to be? You know, I, I want to be viewed as someone that was, uh, wise. Uh, I'd like to take the gift of intellect that I've been given give it back in a way that the sum of my intellect and experience can help other people. Um, so if you take most of my personal traits that I would consider foundations of success, I'd like to package them up in a way that I can give them back. Hmm. Um, and, and then, because I, I, at the end of the day, I don't think, I, I'm, I don't think you leave an organization or a family with much more than than the DNA and the breath, right? So getting back to this idea of small habits, if you can establish for your family in a workplace a set of small habits that makes it better performing but also a better place to be, then, then that's where your DNA is. Hmm. So I think a lot of people want finger, their fingerprints all over everything or they want their, their artwork hanging on all the walls and, they, and signatures and buildings named after them. I don't want that. I just want... You know, for one generation, if I can create a set of habits that are better um, as a result of me being here, then those will pass on for many generations without authorship. And I think that's the best way to sneak up on something is to not do it for credit. Hmm. So that's how I view it. So, I, you know, it's not going to be, you, you won't find it. You won't find it on a building. You won't find it on a wall and you won't find it in a book. Yeah. Well, thank you for imparting to me today and everyone that will watch this interview. And Sure. I'll end the interview with probably after listening to you where I should have started. Uh, is anything else on your mind for leaders today that you want to leave them with? I think we covered uh, most of the key themes. And I think that if I were to summarize it, you know, depending on, on where you are, you know, take the risks early in your life while you still can. And when I say risk, I don't mean high wire acts or <laughs> hella skiing. I mean, like, go get the, exp the work experiences that you need. Be willing, be open. Um, if you can, you know, travel, take a job somewhere else. Um, deal with not having all your friends around for a little while. All that stuff. Um, and then when you feel like it's time to settle down and your, your position in life changes, then you have to actually strive to, to be the best in your field. And I think that takes some. Uh, some conscious effort and work. And don't forget yourself. Like hmm. when I say be yourself, you, you know, there's certain 
aspects of becoming yourself, you have to look in the mirror and kind of every once in a while sit down, take stock, write stuff down. And then there's hygiene involved. Read a book, like go learn from someone. You know, most of the time there's masters out there that have been in your shoes. And then I think the, the back part of your life takes care of itself. The mm -hmm. most critical time in your career is the first 20 years. You know, I'm saying take risks for 10 and for 10, pick a field and go be great at it. I love it. Well, John, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate thank it. Thank you, Doug. Yep. This was wonderful. Thanks so much for watching this episode. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and share it with somebody that you know. If you want more information on the episode or on L3 Leadership, you can go to l3leadership.org.